Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Five and Five today, and that's very much in the theme of the conference, Consequences, because what I will present is the five technologies that IBM Research believes will fundamentally reshape business and society in the next five years. So, the consequences of these technologies. So, let me dive right in. I'll go one by one. The first one. Nobody likes knockoffs, and crypto anchors and blockchain will unite to find counterfeit. So let me explain counterfeit. That's basically fake in the context of physical goods. So what's the problem? Today, in the recent years, the spread of counterfeit goods has become global. And the range of products that are subject to such infringements has increased dramatically. In some countries, 70% of life-saving drugs are counterfeit. What's the root of that problem? It's that supply chains have become more and more complex with many participants across many regions, and so it's very difficult to prevent bad actors in your supply chain. And so what are we suggesting um, to improve the situation? We predict that in five years, the um, immutable ledgers and blockchain, so your auditable log of transactions, in combination with technologies that we call crypto anchors, will scale up to address the counterfeit problem. And thus ensure, really, the authenticities of goods from their origin to the hands of the users. So what are crypto anchors? There are multiple technologies, there's not, there's not one, but essentially, conceptually, crypto anchors attach information to everyday goods in a easy to manufacture manner, yet tamper-proof or very costly to reproduce. And so those could be ink dots, patterns, like cryptographic patterns as ink dots, or tiny computers. And I want to give two concrete examples of crypto anchors that, um, that we work on as, as IBM Research. The first one is in the context of um, point-of-care diagnostic tests, right? These the little handheld uh, medical devices where you can test, for instance, against malaria or HIV. And so while these are very easy to manufacture and easy to use, they are not exempt from counterfeit. So what's observed, for instance, is that the QR codes or the product labels of such tests are altered to, for instance, relabel a cheaper malaria test kit into a more expensive HIV test kit. And so you can, as the, the person uh, creating the, the fake labels, actually increase, increase the margin on the product. So what do we do here? So we, in the, in the IBM Research Lab in Zurich, um, have developed um, a uh, code, an ink dot code, and the the, spe uh, the speciality is that that ink um, dot code is actually placed in the unique and sensitive area of the test. Right? It's not on the package. It's actually in that testing zone that makes the test. And so now you could use your smartphones as the doctor in the field and actually check that code and see whether that's, uh, that test is authentic or, and whether it's expired or not. And more importantly, as you've seen, this um, pattern is actually washed away when in contact with the liquid. So now not only can you check is that indeed an HIV test kit, but also you see whether it's been used before. So that's one. The other one, uh, what you see here, is IBM's smallest computer. It's a really tiny computer. With the advances of technology, you can now make computers with uh, thousands of transistors that fit on the surface of a salt grain. So that's what you see in the right side. It's not rocks. It's salt grains together with a little computer. And now, if you embed these computers with the physical goods, of course, now you can't just merely check the authenticity of the good, but you can do much more, right? You can monitor data, you can analyze data, you can communicate that to, to the, the, the central systems to, for instance, show the history of the good, the state that it's kept in, and you may even be able to act upon that data. So in summary, there are multiple technologies that can make up crypto anchors, and our prediction is that in combination with the 
uh, secure ledgers in the blockchain, we can truly fight counterfeit. We expect the first products to be on the market in, in 18 months, um, but have the, uh, the true impact and the scale up in five years. And we think we can save hundreds of millions of dollars, but much more importantly, we can protect and save lives. Okay, number two, hackers gonna hack until they encounter lattice cryptography. So we shift gears completely. And um, so, so what, we, what we observe today already is um, that the, the cost of, um, and the damage of cybercrime is increasing dramatically year after year. The scope and the sophistications of the attacks and thus the, the, the damage they cause increase um, as soon as solutions, remedies are developed, new attacks emerge, and we already see that today's technology can't cope. But that will only get worse once there are universal, tamper-proof um, quantum computers. And let me explain why. Uh, I'll take a little detour into how crypto works to come to make that argument. Um, so how do we actually know that um, our encrypted data are safe and our, our keys um, are, are hard? Uh, what we do in cryptography is we, we do cryptographic proofs. And essentially, those are logical arguments that show that in order to break the key, um, you need to solve a really, really, really hard problem. So it's either you solve the problem or it's equivalent to solving such a problem. Now, today's keys that are underlying our um, Encrypted transmission, which is RSA, or digital signatures, which would be Diffie-Hellman codes, rely on the factorization, the prime number factorization being hard. And that is true today for classical computers. That's a very hard problem, but not for quantum computers. So someday, when in the distant future, when we have powerful quantum computers that are um, uh, have a low error rate and enough qubits, uh, they will be able to break all of today's cryptographic schemes. But, but research is working on that, right? So we are in IBM Research um, working on schemes what we call, that we call post-quantum cryptography. So essentially finding new hard problems that are hard to solve both for classical computers, because we need the backward stressability, and quantum computers. And one of such uh, these technologies is uh, our uh, lattice cryptography. We've, we, by the way, also submitted to the, to the NIST, which is preparing to standardize the cryptographic schemes for the post-quantum era. So how does lattice cryptography work? So basically, essentially, and I'll just talk in parallel to the, to the little video, lattices are grids of points. So in two dimensions, we can imagine that, and three dimensions, in 100, humans have a little bit of a problem. And there are hard problems in lattices. The one that's the most popular currently is the shortest vector problem, and that is to find the point that's closest, so has the shortest distance to the origin. And that is hard in low dimensions, and if you scale up the dimensions, you can make that a really hard problem to solve for classical computers and, and quantum computers. Just uh, very quickly, um, lattice cryptography is not only useful in the future, but it's also the basis of what we call uh, fully, um, uh, fully homomorphic um, encryption, and that's a method where you can actually work with your data without ever decrypting it. Because that's one of the weak spots today is we encrypt for transition, but then we decrypt in order to do our processing on our computers, and that's a vulnerable spot. So if you would never need to decrypt your data, that's a, that's a great advancement. I won't go into the details of that one. Third, um, AI bias will explode, but only the unbiased AI will survive. And let me, let me say two things. I think we had two, the first speaker actually set the floor for that. But first, I want to say the power of AI is enormous. So if you think about it, data and information is, is growing exponentially. And that's true for almost all professions. So for us humans, it's impossible to read and comprehend all this knowledge that's created daily. We can't. So we rely on cognitive assist, AI, to help our decision-making, 
be it if we are a doctor, to find the best personalized cure for their patients, or if we are material developers, or if we are in the legal domain. And I'll just give one example um, where we, we see this arising in, in, if you will, everyday lives, is in the, in the US, um, the height of the sentence, if you, if you are sentenced by the court, we don't hope that's gonna happen with any of you, but if you're sentenced by the court, the height of the sentence is influenced by your likelihood to re-offend, so to recommit a crime. And that likelihood, in turn, is influenced by models on the likelihood to reoffend. So now, think about it. As the first speaker said, our AI models are only as good as the data that we use to train them. And so, given the power of AI, what we need to do is we need to um, be responsible in developing AI models that are transparent, explainable, and free of bias. So that gets me to the bias. How does bias get into AI models? So there's two ways. One I mentioned already, right? Data, the models are only as good as the data. So if your training data includes, contains bias, racial bias, gender bias, ideological bias, right? We heard women are more concerned about digital transformation. Is there bias in the data from the previous speaker? Um, so that's one way how it gets in. But it's also um, through the person who designed the models. Again, we've seen this in the previous survey. It's the questions you ask influence the answers you get, right? So it is bias gets into these models, and the danger is if we create these biased AI models, we destroy the trust between humans and technology. Now, we in IBM Research predict that we will, in five years, we will have solutions to counter this massive explosion of bias in the models. Um, and then, what, what do we do, right? Uh, it comes back to the Rorschach test that we saw in the beginning. So we are currently working, if you will, on three facets. Um, number zero, and I call that zero um, uh, consciously because I think this is the, really the fundamental um, uh, method is, in our view, ex AI models need to be explainable. What we've seen in the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years is, right, we've moved to these very powerful um, um, AI models that are essentially black boxes, the, the deep neural nets, but also additive tree models. These um, are black boxes. We don't actually, by default, understand anymore why they make a certain prediction. And we strongly believe and are working on bringing explainability back to these complex models so that if the likelihood of me reoffending um, and recommitting a crime is set, it's also said what are the features, what are the factors that actually uh, influenced that prediction of the model. So that's zero in my view. But then furthermore, we work on also um, pre-processing algorithms to remove bias from data sets. So you actually first go through your data set, you, you remove bias as much as possible before you train, and then third, um, if you don't actually have access to the data set that was used to train your model, um, we are currently in the process actually working also with MIT to develop methods that create a score on the level of bias in the models. So we are confident there are solutions, there are ways um, that will help us detect and remove bias from AI models so that we would spot even if you don't have access to the training data, that Norman was trained on a very biased set of images and videos. Fourth, today quantum computing is a researcher's playground, but in five years it will be mainstream. So what we predict is that in five years, uh, quantum computing will have left the lab and will be um, used by a new community of professionals and developers to really leverage this, this, new, this new computing paradigm to solve problems that have not been solved before. And so what will happen is, if we, if we look at the whole chain from education to using of these new technologies, we believe quantum computing will be on the university curricula 
be it for computer scientists or chemists because of its impact in, in simulating molecules and chemical reactions, but also for business. We anticipate a new community of, of developers evolving that really take advantage of this very different scheme and algorithms and, and, and advancing these algorithms for, for the quantum computing. And we will also, we also anticipate that these early use cases that um, will evolve rapidly, right? So let me just give an example of an early, early use case besides attempting to um, uh, hack our cryptographic keys is in, the, in simulating uh, chemical molecules and the outcomes of chemical reactions. So that's where actually originally Feynman proposed to have a quantum computer for simulating the world. So that's exactly that. And then we can use that power to develop new drugs, to develop new uh, sources of energy. So that's, that's one. Now, what are we doing to actually actively advance this? Um, as, as you may know, um, because this is really a paradigm shift in how you compute, it's essential that we build that community. Right? It's, it's, it's not just um, a faster algorithm, it's, it's really different. So what IBM has done with IBM Q experience, we make com quantum computing available in the cloud. So in order, so that's a, that's a portal where you can use um, quantum computing, you can, you, can, you can use your algorithms or you can develop algorithms to test it. It's um, a forum to exchange about quantum, quantum computing and it contains tutorials and, and how these new way of computing works. And what we see is we have 80,000 users from 143 countries already, 3 million executions of, of statements, um, uh, 1,500 universities and 300 high schools um, using, using our early users and using in an exploratory manner these quantum computers. But we also um, created IBM Q Network, and that's, we launched that in December 2017, so last year, to um, create a network of Fortune 500 companies and universities who will um, share the mission with us to advance quantum, quantum computing and launch the first um, quantum applications. All right. Last but not least, this is a little bit shorter because this is the state of the internet and that's probably farthest away, even though connected. Um, so the fifth one is our oceans are dirty and AI-powered robot microscopes may save them. So what's the background for this? Um, in uh, 2025, half of the Earth's population will live in water-stressed areas. And yet, we have actually little or insufficient amount of data to monitor and understand, if you will, our most important natural resource that we all depend on, right? We all know how long we can live without water. So what we propose is um, uh, that new autonomous um, uh, robots with microscopes will be used to monitor the state of oceans and rivers continuously connected to the cloud, so beaming, beaming the data up, so that we start to be able to collect comprehensive knowledge about the state of the ocean. And there's one interesting twist to that. You see the word plankton um, in the bottom. So in general, the, 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 the vision is to have these AI-powered nanorobots, if you will, that, that are, because they have solar cells, act uh, autonomously for a long time. But specifically, IBM Research is, um, is looking to indirectly measure the state of the ocean. Because one thing you could do is you could equip your little nanorobot with a lot of chemical sensors, and then you could measure the concentration of certain pollutants, but you're never complete, right? If there are new kind of pollutions coming into the ocean, you don't have your sensor on it, then you won't detect it. So the IBM researchers actually in the, in the US took a twist to that um, by not directly measuring uh, the concentration of certain pollutions, but by observing plankton. Because plankton is very sensitive to the, to the state of the ocean, and it's in the beginning of the food chain. So if we use plankton as our sensor, then we actually get 
a comprehensive monitoring of the, the state of the ocean and, and have data about that. Okay, that concludes the presentation. I actually want to do a little poll if you agree with me, which of these five technologies you think is going to be the most important and impactful. So I'll just try to do that with raising hands, um, and I try to count roughly. Um, I'll just go through them one by one. So for those who think the uh, crypto anchors are the most important, so if you could raise your hands. Okay, a few, five. Hackers gonna hack uh, crypto lettuces. Okay, that's maybe also five. I can in the background. The nano robots to measure the state of the ocean. Okay, that that exceeds the previous one. I would say thirty. AI bias. Yeah, that's the top right now. And then quantum computing as the last one. Okay, that's a hard fall, but I think the winner is AI bias, and I think that's very much, um, I think, aligned also with the, what the first speaker showed us. I'll conclude with one last slide. I've mentioned a couple of times, these are the predictions by IBM Research. We issue them every year in the beginning of the year, and I wanted to start with saying who we are, IBM Research. So we have 12 labs globally. I'm personally coming from the Zurich Research Lab, so that's the closest lab from here. Um, we have uh, 25 years of patent history, six Nobel, Nobel Prizes, and 3,000 active, curious researchers worldwide who also, as one of the inspirations, um, engage with clients. So if you're interested, Zurich is um, probably four hours of light changing in Munich away, so we invite you uh, very much to join us in our client center in, in Zurich. Thank you.